Guys, you'll never guess what happened today. I remembered my YouTube password. <laughs> anyway, welcome back to another Ranting Real Fan Upload. As some of you may know, filming trains is a fun pastime of mine, which differs from most in that most people like taking photos, but I much prefer videos. In taking videos, I find that some clips can be rendered bad or just not uploadable because of certain elements that happen during the video, for various reasons and most of all, unspoken rules. A lot of real fans seem to not understand these unspoken rules, and with this video, these will now be said aloud, so there's no excuses. I don't see any reason to waste your time, so here's the first rule. the 180 degree rules concept that if you haven't actually taken a video class, you might not be aware of it, but the second I explain to you what it is, you'll probably have done this subconsciously already. The 180 degree rule is generally used in a studio production, but is regularly applied to railfed photography, but the general idea is this. In a multi-camera production, the cameras arrange themselves at an angle no more than a half circle, or 180 degrees, so that the other cameras are not in any of the other camera shots. You see this in news media all the time. Applying this to train photography, it's very common for photo lines to be formed so that no person is in the shot. And when rail fans or filmers don't abide by this rule, it is pretty reasonable for those in the photo line to get a little frustrated and pissed off. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Last October, I was chasing the annual Conway Scenic 470 Club excursion between North Conway and Fabians, New Hampshire. At Notchland Road, just south of Crawford Notch, the train let off rail fans for a photo run by. Naturally, upwards of 50 photographers formed a photo line, of which I was a part of. And as you can see, there's a slew of clueless people setting up shots in front of the photo line, completely disregarding the 180 degree rule. Side note, if you have any interest in watching the full chase, the video is public on my rail video channel, Zephyr's Trains. This rule really only applies if there's more than one rail fan in a particular location, or a group for that matter, so you generally won't run into this unless you regularly hang out with groups of people while chasing or watching trains. This about wraps it up for the 180 degree rule, and now we're moving on to rule number two. Situational awareness is a trait that is excruciatingly hard to teach, as plenty of rail fans are socially awkward, which would be dishonest to completely exclude myself from that crowd, but I digress. Situational awareness can be applied in so many scenarios, such as a photographer that has finished taking their photos, generally of the lead units, and then walks directly in front of a video camera that is trying to take videos. Or maybe someone expecting one train and another sneaks up on them. The list goes on. Or, rather famously, Absolutely brain-dead people driving their shitbox vehicles directly in front of a moving train, such as this clip from September of 2023. Due to a washout on MTA's Fitchburg line, Pan Am Southern Intermodal train number 264 could not run its usual route over the Patriot Corridor to Mechanicville via Gardner, Deerfield, and the famous Huzak Tunnel. So it took a detour south out of their usual terminus at Ayer, Massachusetts, and then went west to Chicago via CSX's Worcester and Berkshire stubs. While running on the Worcester sub, more specifically, the town of Clinton, Massachusetts, there are multiple cars that pass right in front of the well over 10 10,000 foot train. If that didn't make you say, oh shit, I don't know what will. After this very, very near miss, the train continued west of Chicago without further incident with this very interesting lash-up of power. That was a very simple rundown of situational awareness, but this isn't a skill to apply to rail fanning only. Being aware of your surroundings is a very useful trait in day-to-day -day life. With that, on to rule three. As someone who records video, audio is a very important element of any video, about as important as the footage itself. So I take audio production very seriously when filming. In my head, generally a rule that makes sense to me is as follows. When the gates go down, you shouldn't move a muscle in your vocal cords. Horn audio, bell audio, or prime mover audio can be completely negated by some moron yapping, or perhaps a separate doofus blowing his shitty train horn at the train passing by. This is probably the one that has affected me the most, so I'm just a tad passionate about this one. This occurred to me on so many occasions, I'm gonna make a quick montage of the time I've yelled at my friends to quit their damn yapping. What are you doing, you Why don't shut up, you not understand? Shut up! No! Shut up! <laughs> Why are these LEDs? And I think that's about wrapping it up. I think that's plenty of clips for you to see what I'm talking about. Um, on to rule four.
trespassing is unlike the previous rules in that the others were just minor inconveniences, but criminal trespassing is actually a federal misdemeanor. That's only if you're actually prosecuted though, so if a police officer tells you to move or a rail worker tells you to do your trespassing, just find a different spot to avoid all the trouble. I'm well aware that trespassing is a pretty controversial issue, but I feel there are some general rules to follow. If you're in the gauge, move. If you have items that are over the gauge in some way, move them. If you walk into a rail yard, you should probably skedaddle. There really isn't that much to this one, it's literally just don't commit crimes. They're bad. And so are your wedge shots, you normie piece of shit. With that said, on to the final rule, number five. Ah yes, the ones that obnoxiously know everything about everywhere and always feel they need to tell whatever poor sod is standing next to them on that particular day. Hopefully following the 180 degree rule, of course. These absolute cretins that are always saying specific details about the specific models of train, and I don't mean regular things like normal rail fence notice, such as the difference between an EMD and a GE. Now I'm talking some about some like really niche shit, like how a particular rail line was shifted like 70 years ago because the river was starting to move. Like dog, I did not ask. Or my personal favorite, the ones that don't don't work for the railroad and use the word we when referring to railroad equipment. Show like, oh yeah, we acquired a couple of Dash 8s a couple months ago. My brother in Christ, who is we? And then of course there are the fellows that could tell the difference between things that look almost the same, such as these two units. Can you tell me the difference? This was actually a trick question. The only difference is on the other side of the unit. The difference is this one has a vent on the side and one has DC traction motors and the other has AC traction motors. No, I'm not kidding. That is literally the only two differences between these two models. To anyone that got that answer right, number one, why? And number two, you know far, far too much. That about wraps up today's video. Thanks for watching as always. I'll see you guys in another three months because I'm a lazy ass human being. But for real, thanks for all the support on these videos and I hope all the trains you're waiting for have high greens. See ya.